said, settle down, settle down, everything is Coming to you from Forager Brewery in Rochester. Said, no, I'm not, no, Our town. I lost my head on the door. She said, hey, hey, hey. Are you one of the estimated 5 million people in the U.S. getting married this year? Well, if you are, then you might be looking for someone like this woman right here. Kirsten Fisher Carmen from Fab Event Designs. Welcome to our town. Thanks for having me. Great. So the wedding business is a really booming business. Mm -hmm. Is it true that people spend about $28,000 and upwards? Uh, yes, I would definitely say that that's probably the average. Um, the biggest thing that um, influences cost is going to be guest list and of course the decadence. Um, if people decide to have um, kind of an over the top wedding with lots of tall centerpieces, things like that, that really drives cost. Oh wow. So what are some of the big requests that you get when people come to you to help plan their wedding? Um, I think the first thing a lot of people will tell me is that they want it to be fun. They want great food, they want great entertainment, they want their guests to leave after having a great time and feeling like they were really treated um, and to get to know the couple better through the elements of the wedding. Great. So as a wedding insider, you must know all the different trends. I know when I got married, um, I think it was right when the royal wedding was happening, and so I was going into all these bridal stores, and the women, um, all the dresses had long sleeves, yes. and then Great Gatsby had just come out, so there was all this art deco going on. Mm -hmm. Is there something for this coming year that you're sort of seeing as a trend um, in terms of requests or just things, um, styles out there? Yeah, I think it. I think it's. There's kind of two different styles that I see. I see a trend towards more elegant and glamorous weddings, so really simple lines in the dresses. Um, the decor is a lot more um, monochromatic, lots of candlelight, lots of really lush flowers. Um, and the opposite of that is I see a lot of what they're calling boho chic. So you'll see a lot of um, gowns that are not necessarily your traditional gowns, um, a-line um, a-line styles or slip dresses. Um, really eclectic decor, um, larger bouquets with a lot of different colors in them. So it's kind of um, two big trends for, you know, everybody's got their tastes and styles, and so they're two beautiful trends that fit both ends of the spectrum. Wow. So here in Rochester, um, we have quite a few different vendors and services and locations. Um, are there any that you often work with or that um, you see a lot of couples coming and requesting? Um, I do see a lot of couples coming in and asking what they can do that's different. Um, and, and an interactive wedding is what a lot of people are looking for. They don't necessarily want guests to have to come in and sit down and mm -hmm. just watch everything going on. Um, so I have a lot of clients that will request special things. Um, you know, one idea is bringing in a coffee cart so that they're not just going up and grabbing a cup of coffee. It's somebody that's serving specialty coffee. Um, interactive desserts. So having um, one of the big things right now is a donut wall. So they walk up and they nice. pick their pick their dessert or miniature desserts um, where they can um, select if they love, you know, cupcakes or dessert shooters and cake pops and things like that. And so um, between those items for food, photo booths are always really popular. Um, a lot of at home um, and private event or private residence weddings have yard games and different things that keep guests moving and um, having fun and really getting the conversation going. Wonderful. So I know there's um, a lot of places where you can get ideas. You can go online, but there's also these wedding expos. And so there was just one in January, January 7th, mm -hmm. um, and there's going to be one on Unveiled here in Rochester. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about um, how, how these expos kind of work and um, if these are these are good places to get ideas? Yeah. So it's um, the expos are, are usually a collection of vendors um, from all across you know, the different things that you're gonna hire for your wedding. Um, and it's a really great way to meet people, inter kind of interview them, see um, if there's any specials that they're running. A lot of times people going to these, um, or vendors running these booths at these expos are gonna offer their, or showcase their talents, and then also offer discounts to um, different services that they have. Um, Right now it's what they call engagement season. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of, um, most of the couples are getting engaged between Thanksgiving and Valentine's Day. And so the time of year, it's really great if people are still trying to plan a 2017 wedding or even looking beyond to 2018. Okay, great. Um, and is there, a, you know, weddings can be really stressful. Um, mm -hmm. And I know there are a lot of fun. I love weddings, but yeah. um, there's a lot of work. Is there any advice that you give uh, your couples? Um, let us handle it. Um, when, the, when you hire a planner or coordinator, you're allowing yourselves to really enjoy the day and just be hosts and guests at your own wedding. Um, take their time. You don't have to rush into anything, rush into decisions. Um, really talk about it with the two of you. There's a lot of outside influences when you're trying to plan your wedding. Um, and also don't be pressured by everything that you see. You don't have to have 
um, you know, a traditional wedding. Do something that you really enjoy and love, and it's going to make the process a lot more fun and the day much more memorable for you and your families. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. So exciting. Um, I'm sure you have your work cut out for you for the next year. Um, and if you're any of you out there looking for uh, wedding planning, please check out Kirsten Carmen Fisher at Fab Event Design. Thank you so much. is brought to you in part by the following amazing people and organizations. The new Clements Subaru proudly partners with award-winning KSMQ Public Television. Clements Subaru of Rochester. Clements Clear Value Promise is to make buying a Subaru fast, fair, and simple. Prow Company, a hands-on commercial property leasing company. Leasing commercial properties in Rochester, Minnesota since 1952. Realtors and brokers welcome. Prow Company. The Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. And the members of KSMQ Public Television. Thank you. Here from Forager in Rochester, more great stories on our town coming your way. Monday is the 22nd annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We Have a Dream Breakfast. Dee Sable from the Diversity Council is here to tell us more. If you had any doubt, winter is here and we take a ride in a 40-ton snow monster in our Our Town Walkabout. Coming up next, we find out if there's more to the history center of Olmstead County than just old stuff. That's on Our Town Culture. I'm Pat Carlson. I'm the Executive Director of the History Center of Olmsted County. The History Center is a place where people can gather to learn about Olmsted County through research, through looking at the materials we have, through looking at our exhibits. It helps people learn from the past to better inform the future. Well, right now the goal that we have is to bring together the uh, artifacts and the archives that we have so that they're accessible to folks here in the community. We also want to, uh, goals for this year are increasing our membership and offering more opportunities for people to come out and experience educational opportunities such as classes and workshops or to have opportunities for people to hold events out here. I know that we have student groups coming through who want to find out what happened to a certain individual people doing genealogical research and similar kinds of things, or people wanting to know, you know, where's that apple core I saw before, or, or what does a, a general store look like? That's really what we're here for. I'm hopeful that as we go forward, we'll become more of a community destination for people, whether it's for weddings, whether it's for a short uh, rent a room to use for a uh, conference, uh, but to come out here and learn from what we have. In the summer, we have large events that, that um, have anywhere from eight to 1,200 people at them, such as the Living History Fair, or the Days of Yesteryear, where they have the, the threshing machines. And all of that is something for people to come and experience history, not just read about it in a book. We also have teaching programs out here, educational programs, summer camp, day camps for kids. The Roosters is, is one of the antique ball teams. There are a series of them. Most of them are connected with a uh, local history museum in another county or community in uh, Minnesota. And they play old time baseball. And we have a tournament here every year. The Roosters um, self-fund for the most part, and they also return some revenue to the History Center for upkeep of the ballpark. But we also have the archives where you can do genealogical or family research as well. I know that uh, people are very astounded by the amount of the archives and the um, public records we have of lives, deaths, marriages, uh, probate court records that are available and accessible to folks. It's always kind of astounding. 
I'm Ryan Heron, and I'm the Collections Manager for the History Center of Homestead County. So what I do is manage both the archival collection and the uh, 3D collection, or the material culture collection. Uh, so what that means is I can work with artifacts from uh, as recent as yesterday. Uh, if people donated things that happened yesterday, we'd accept them or from the founding of the county. So I work with things that are over 100 years old on almost a daily or weekly basis. Probably the most common reaction is, I didn't know this place was here. And that is probably visitors who've lived in Olmsted County for quite a few years, or I've been meaning to come out here, but I didn't know how much I would enjoy it. For more information about this story and other Our Town features, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter at KSMQ hashtag Our Town, or ksmq.org slash Our Town. You're invited. Don't you just love to be included? Charter House is hosting its ninth art exhibit in the Parkside Gallery featuring artists Patricia Dunwalker and Anne Black Sinek. The opening will take place on Thursday, January 19th from 4.30 to 7 p.m. The Parkside Art Gallery is located on the first floor of Charter House on 2nd Street Northwest. There will be a gallery talk at 5.15 and refreshments will be provided along with live music by the Cameo String Trio. And it's free! Hashtag Monday Motivation. I don't know about you, but some weeks I need a jump start on Monday morning, and Mayo Clinic has quarterly agreed to oblige. Each week they provide tips, encouragement, and live Q&A with their wellness champions. Next week, Dr. Sarah Filmalter from Sports Medicine will help you take the first step toward getting in shape by discussing ways to start and maintain your New Year's resolutions. You can find her on Twitter or Facebook with the hashtag Monday Motivation. January should be declared Volleyball and Hockey Month here in Rochester. The Rochester Amateur Sports Commission calendar tells me that you can watch one or both of these sports every weekend this month. The Frostbite Volleyball Festival is your next opportunity on January 21st and 22nd at the RCTC Sports Center. The Rochester Youth Hockey Association hosts a Bantam B level tournament at Graham Arena on the same date. So get out and cheer our youth as they keep their bodies moving through these cold winter months. And speaking of cold, moving, and winter, the list of events for the Rochester Winterfest 15 is out. From January 26th through February 12th, try out ice skating, bike riding in the snow, Nordic skiing, running, walking, swimming, oh, maybe just plunging then getting out real fast, or cardboard sledding all over town. Details can be found at rochesterwinterfest.com. Stay with us as we hit the streets clearing snow on this week's Our Town Walkabout. power truck that I drive here is a 2004 tandem, uh, roughly loaded, fully weight, we're about 80,000 pounds, 13 foot blade on the front, 12 foot wing on the side. Right now we are just the, uh, we are entering the, what we call the corridor uh, of Rochester here, and I'm just dropping my front plow in the wing to get any material off that can be on the road. We have heavy snow coming in. We do not really want to get the roads wet right now because the snow will accumulate on the road. Rush hour does make it a little bit difficult here. Um, of course, we'll have more cars. We don't have the room. Give us room. I do enjoy plowing snow. Um, it's, uh, it's really nice to see what you have done at the end of the night. Our, what we really like to try to do is keep any cars out of the ditch or off the wall if possible. The levers we have here in the truck, uh, the four right to my right here. The first one would be my box. My second lever is going to be my front plow. The third lever would be what they call an underbody. It's a scraper underneath the truck. And my fourth lever is the wing lever. Probably the, the biggest mistake most cars have is either pulling 
directly in front of us, putting on their brakes, or actually following too close. Cars are allowed to pass us. Uh, we don't have a problem with that. The best thing that makes us really feel good is if we can get by without any accidents. We got family at home. We want to get home safe. We want everybody else to get home safe as well. Federal government buildings will be closed on Monday to honor the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And this person right here, this gal D, is going to tell us how you can spend your time celebrating Dr. King's accomplishments and learning about what's happening these days. Stay with us. Our past. Remembering what made us who we are today. Brought to you by the History Center of Olmsted County. In April 1923, the Civic and Commerce Association and the Kiwanis announced a merger, forming the Rochester Civic Association. As part of a new membership drive, teams of four played a game driving fictitious cars from New York to Rochester. Each team was allotted mileage equal to the membership fees they brought in. The first driver to sign up was J.O. Nelson of Nelson Motor Sales. Other businesses included the Case Auto Company and the Boston Clothing House. Since women were welcome as members, the Business and Professional Women's Club had two teams. The teams met at the Zumbro Hotel for lunch each day of the race. Some of the teams encountered complications, such as rounding a corner too quickly and crashing, being arrested for speeding, or running out of gas. The race and drive ended successfully with J.O. Nelson winning and the Rochester Civic Association gaining 550 new members. Oh, welcome back to the Forager Microbrewery and Restaurant in Eric Olson. Monday, of course, we'll be celebrating the 22nd annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We Have a Dream Breakfast, along with a host of other activities in Rochester. Here to tell us more about the day's events and work being done in Rochester surrounding diversity and civil rights is Dee Sable, Executive Director of Rochester Diversity Council. Welcome, Dee. Thank you. Glad to be here. And you have a full plate coming up. Absolutely. So really excited about the events coming up this coming Monday. Uh, really an inter integrated uh, approach to celebrating the life of, of Dr. King. And uh, so it starts with the breakfast and it's, it's a it's an inclusive and broad community event. We expect uh, more than 600 people to attend. And then it's followed immediately by a rally and the march and then um, a celebration and, and ends with a birthday party mm -hmm. for Dr. King. That's great. Um, there, so after the MLK breakfast, the rally and the march and the, and the, the, cel the celebration at the end, um, are those going to be happening in different parts of the, of the community? Everything is integrated. So we okay. start at the Mayo Civic Center great. and we have the breakfast followed by the rally, followed by the march which, which goes through downtown and ends back at the Civic Center and the final two events are there as well. So we really make it easy for people to come out and spend some really good, meaningful time uh, in these activities, which tended in the past to be, you know, we had one audience that came out for the breakfast, and that tended to be a business audience. And then there was another, a second audience, more diverse audience, that came out for the following activities. And we really wanted uh, the, the opportunity to bring these audiences together and to share some common time around uh, this celebration. And the Diversity Council, if folks aren't really aware of it, what are your primary, what are the primary goals? So we do our work in three equity focused areas, uh, concentrating our efforts on civic e equity, educational equity, and health equity. And those seem kind of like broad and, and ambiguous terms, but we really work on um, you know, equal right and equal protection under law, both through law enforcement and the judicial process, equal participation and representation in the political process, um, equal participation in both the design and the benefit from public policy, 
um, that, e that individuals have the uh, opportunities necessary to reach their full potential in an educational sense. And also, uh, you know, we do work in those things that are the underlying um, predeterminants of health, and they are access to affordable housing, food security, mobility, those types of things. So those are, that's where we're doing our work in the community. And you have, you have an educational component, too. I think where you can go into workplaces, for example, and help Absolutely. educate, work with a staff that Absolutely. maybe has never talked about issues like that before, and they need to address them huge part of what we do. If you think about the um, employment climate, the, the work climate, uh, you know, we, we have some unique challenges in this moment in time. So we have five generations in the workplace, which is unprecedented. We have, um, you know, a shortage really of skilled labor in this area. And we also have a, a vastly diversifying workforce here. And so how do we use those things and, and do some work in organizations and businesses to prepare them to be more inclusive workplaces so they can retain good staff and attract good staff and uh, really function well. So the things that we used to call soft skills, mm -hmm. you know, learning to deal with other cultures, are really critical skills for people and businesses to be successful That's now. That's a really comprehensive approach, and, and I think one of the things that really excites me about Rochester now and Rochester moving forward is that incredible diversity and the growing diversity. And as you all know, that comes with a responsibility to make sure that our communities are as inclusive as possible and really committed to social justice for everyone. So I, if you had to give Rochester a grade um, in terms of how we're doing with diversity and inclusion as you know, being there on the front lines, boots on the ground, what would you say? Well, I think, um, you know, if you were grading on a curve, and I think that's important. <laughs> it's important because I think Rochester has, this region has both the desire and the potential to be exceptional, really. And so if you were grading on a curve against other communities similar to this in the nation, I'd give it a C minus. If you were grading Rochester against um, other communities in the region, I'd give it a good solid B. Um, the difference being that the region is, is farther behind many other parts of the country in acknowledging uh, diversity and, and the importance of cultural inclusion and, and um, really looking at every facet of human difference and finding ways to honor and incorporate that difference. Um, this region is behind. Uh, Rochester has so much potential and so many willing participants and so much goodness of spirit and uh, openness that it's just really kind of galvanizing that and, and moving forward as a community. And as more cultures become part of the community, that will also, there'll be give and take and people will learn from each other. I would assume that would help. Uh, in Austin, there are, I think, 53 first languages exactly. spoken at the junior high school there. Yeah, and more than that here. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and language is important, but other parts of culture. One thing we hear about Rochester is that um, while it's a pretty welcoming place and, and um, you know, it does a good job in, in some sense of acculturating many people, there's not a lot of room here for pluralism and there's not a lot of room for people to bring their entire selves, their authentic selves with them to the workplace or to other places in the community. Uh, and, and so working on that so that there is truly a sense of, of pluralism and, and that uh, you don't have to lose a lot of yourself in order to come and be comfortable in Rochester. And pluralism is really was at the heart of Martin Luther King's legacy, and Absolutely. so I'm really excited about this integrative approach on Monday um, with the day's activities. I actually have a little bit of a tradition that I do every Martin Luther King Day. I always read uh, Martin Luther King's letters from Birmingham Jail from, in, from 1963, and I also listen to his speech on Vietnam. So not the I Have a Dream speech, right. but his speech about Vietnam, because I think it's a wonderful reminder that the civil rights movement wasn't just about um, the freedom struggle for African Americans, but it was about fighting injustice everywhere. Absolutely. And so I wonder how could we as a community con continue to keep alive the legacy of Martin Luther King throughout the other days of the year, all of the th 364 uh, days of the year? I think one of the most important things that we can do is truly learn to honor one another and um, to, to be more than lip service and, and to get past minimalization. So if you think of kind of the bell curve of where are people on issues of diversity and understanding diversity, you know, there's that huge part of the 
the top of the of the bell that is minimization. You know, we we kind of minimize, and those are the kinds of things like, well, really, don't all lives matter? Or, um, you know. Uh, let's just do a don't ask, don't tell, because then aren't we all fine in that sense? And it's a, it's a much better place to be than denial or uh, some of the other phases, but to really get past that and say, those things aren't really the important part of what we're doing, but we have to acknowledge them in order to move beyond them. I had the opportunity uh, earlier this week to go to a hate and bias um, symposium that was held, uh, it was higher education based, and there was a student panel and this young woman, woman of color, who was a senior in college, said something that seemed to me so impactful. She said, uh, we were talking about, you know, the fact that these students of color in, in predominantly white classrooms and predominantly white colleges spend a great deal of their time educating the people around them. Not just the students, but the institutions and their faci facilitators and teachers. And she said, I don't have the time to do that. I've got this life, and I don't have the time for you to decide whether or not I'm your equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to live my life as an equal and not meet you where you are and try to bring you up on what needs to happen. And that's really kind of, I think, the heart of what we want to do is ask people, take that step. Realize we are all equal, regardless of any difference. We could start on Monday. Go to Absolutely. Parade. Please come out. It's going to be a fabulous series of events and, and an opportunity to really engage with one another. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dee, for sharing yeah. with us. And uh, thank you for joining us today on Our Town. Check us out again next week when we talk about the next step in transportation. Will there be driverless passenger shuttles in Rochester's future? We'll see you again next week here on Our Town, the show about Rochester. Oh,